Democratic Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett of Dallas. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Absolutely. So I wanted to just start by asking what's making a lot of headlines this afternoon uh, as we speak, and that is Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett of Austin has called for President Biden to withdraw from his reelection bid. And I'm wondering what you think about that. I think that it's a half-brained idea. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying a lot of things, but they've not explained exactly how we will be in a better position to win. Um, we know that it takes a lot of money to run for office. No one could just get the hundred something million dollars that the president has on hand transferred to them and be the person. Um, also, you know, when we say we respect democracy and we respect people's votes, how is it that you decide who's next? Are we going to just pick the next person? It doesn't work that way. And finally, this president has a record to run on. Um, and actually, I said finally. But the other thing about this that is really weird to me is that the president was initially elected in 1972. Lloyd Doggett was initially elected in 1973 is and is only a couple of years behind the president. So um, it just doesn't feel like this is the space that it should be coming from. And so, I mean, does his announcement surprise you? It, it did. I remember when we went through redistricting and got our new lines, there was all this chatter about how Lloyd Doggett should step aside and allow the next generation to run. So absolutely, I never anticipated in a million years um, that he would do this. Why do you think there so many people seem very surprised uh, after the debate about President Biden's performance? Because yeah, there I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't anticipate that the president would perform that way. I was expecting um, a little bit more of a knockout. Um, we knew that Trump would go in and lie. And I also expected CNN to do a little bit better at actually moderating. Um, instead of just allowing Trump to kind of say whatever he wanted to say. But I fully anticipated that the president knew that he was going to come in lying, that he would come in lying about things such as January 6th, and that he would actually beat him down on those issues. It didn't happen. I think that the president was overprepared. And I think that the strategy that was given to him by the team was one more so of let him lie and maybe the moderators will fix it. But you just appear presidential and you focus in on the substance. And I think that there is no question about who won on substance, but when it came down to style, um, people felt as if there was the more energy uh, coming from the Trump side. And what do you say about the reports that have come out since the debate? I know that uh, a veteran journalist Carl Bernstein came out today saying that he's heard from at least a dozen sources saying that the president has slowed down, his cognitive abilities have slowed down, and it's been apparent to uh, top aides in meetings. Yeah, I don't know really what to say about that, except for the fact that people forget that this president has never been known as an orator. He has never been in a, a Barack Obama. In addition to that, people forget that he has a stutter, and a stutter isn't something that you have surgery for to correct. It is something that you are taught over time how to deal with and how to get over, but it never is a thing that necessarily heals. And as he is aging, I think it is more difficult for him to try to make sure that he is using those skills to get over. So yeah, it's quite apparent, but I need people to remember that this is a man who grew up stuttering and had a speaking impediment where he has to consistently work around um, the speech. But when we look at the results of this president, the results cannot be questioned whatsoever um, versus the fact that he may not be the most eloquent orator. Some of the uh, CNN just released a poll this afternoon saying most people, I think it was 75 percent of Democrats think or if people think that uh, the Democrats would do better without President Biden on the ticket. So you, <laughs> you, you would disagree with that. I, I disagree with that. First of all, people need to recognize that this election should be an issues-driven election and it should be a values-driven election. The fact that we're talking about the fact that the president um, struggled with getting some of his words and now it's the end of his campaign versus a guy who has 34 felony convictions and along with another 50-something 
felonies that are pending against him, along with the Supreme Court that has just decided that he can go out and commit more crimes and not be charged with them, I think that people have to start to figure out which one is a bigger priority. Having someone who may stutter over some of his words or having someone that may literally decide that he's going to be the dictator that he said he was going to be on, on day one and someone that will further embolden an already terrible court by adding two more justices to that court and hurting American people over and over and over again. So you don't think that uh, President Biden's uh, cognitive abilities would have any impact on his second term? So as it relates to his cognitive abilities, I have not personally experienced something where I say cognitively he is struggling. As it relates to, again, the stutter and struggling to get the words out, absolutely, I can see that. But even still, people are acting as if we don't have a system in place. We live in Dallas, Texas, where we know JFK was assassinated. We have certain things in place and systems so that if someone is unable to serve, there is a ticket. We're not just voting for President Biden. We're voting for Vice President Kamala Harris, who is over 30 years younger than the president. And so for those that have concerns about his age, those that have concerns about his cognitive abilities, it is a, an entire ticket. There is someone that is there. And that's what people need to focus in on and recognize there's already a system in place so that if something happens to the top, there's somebody that's right there and ready to step in. And my last question on this topic before we move to the Supreme Court ruling, uh, I wanted to ask you, just following up on what you said, how likely do you think the scenario is that if President Biden is going to be reelected in November, that he will not serve out a full term and then that uh, Vice President Harris would take over? I have no idea. I mean, you're asking me to pretend to be Miss Cleo and have a little and have a little ball. I, mean, I have no idea, but I know that the heart to serve is there. I know that if he is able to serve, he absolutely will serve. All right. So let's talk about the Supreme Court ruling, the historic ruling uh, from yesterday. And what was your reaction to it? I was quite devastated. Um, I listened to oral arguments, um, which were interesting, to say the least. And I knew that the Supreme Court wanted to go further than the question that was presented to them. I never imagined that they would tie the hands of the DOJ or any other prosecutors, uh, for that matter, so much so that they would insulate and literally make a president be above the law. That is something that we don't stand for in this country, or at least we used to not stand for. And essentially what they have done is they have said, here you go, Mr. Trump, if you end up back in office, we've got your back and you can do whatever you want to. Um, you can bring that retribution that you were talking about and no one will be able to prosecute you for it. They have literally insulated him to commit whatever crimes, additional crimes he wants to commit. Well, the court yesterday seemed to have like three different uh, distinctions. They had uh, said that the president ha or any president has uh, immunity, blanket immunity, when it comes to serving out, carrying out his or her duties that are called for in the Constitution, and then presumptive immunity when it comes to, quote unquote, official acts and but no such immunity for unofficial acts. Why does that not satisfy you? Yeah, because uh, basically what they laid out is that if you use officials in any way, then that is an official act. And so they gave this broad um, definition, which is the type of definition that he was seeking in the first place, um, but literally engaging in basically a criminal conspiracy with your DOJ or with your house counsel or anyone else that can be considered an official act because they are acting in their official capacity to do something that is unofficial. And that that is where the problem is. And even if you determine that this is what's taking place, they're saying, you know what? 
you're not allowed to use anything that was gleaned in the conversations um, with these officials, even if they are saying that it's unofficial. Um, and so it really is wide sweeping. And considering the fact that, you know, Trump took his vice president and he tried to tell him, hey, do not certify the election. He was talking to someone who was official at that time. He was official at that time. And so now you're saying that you can commit a coup and no one can delve into those conversations and use that as evidence against you. That's a problem. Well, that's going to be now up to this federal judge in Washington, D.C., who's overseeing the case to figure that out. Right. It is going to be up to, to Judge Chuckin. And I think that she's incredibly intelligent and I think that she will listen to the evidence. And I think that she will try to follow this new created law um, that the Supreme Court has laid out. But I think that honestly, no matter what she does, if she doesn't come up with a solution that they want, they fully anticipate that they will get the case back on appeal and they will make whatever changes they want to make. So essentially, Trump has managed to consolidate judicial powers under him. Trump has also managed to consolidate legislative powers under him. That is why the House has been so ineffective because the House will not move without the approval of Donald Trump. This is not America. We are supposed to have three separate but equal branches of government that are able to do checks and balances. Right now, if Trump is reelected, the trifecta would have been completed and he will sit in the White House and have the power of the House, the Senate, as well as the judiciary and anyone who cares about democracy should be concerned. And my last question to you is, does this raise the stakes for the 2024 election? And what impact do you think it will have on the race? I think that it, I think that this terrible Supreme Court has consistently raised the stakes. We know that their approval rating is the lowest that it's ever been. We know that the American people don't have the trust or faith in the Supreme Court as it is because they did things such as overturn Roe, because they've done things such as this immunity case, because they've done things such as go after affirmative action, because they've gone after the LGBTQIA community. I think that it's very clear that this Supreme Court is anti almost everyone in this country. And so with that being said, they should be concerned. And even if you don't like either one of the candidates, you should show up and vote simply if you care about your freedoms going forward and whether or not they will cease to exist because Trump has already made it clear that he plans to appoint two more justices. And so getting two of those Republican justices to step down so that he can have two appointments, and these appointments are for a lifetime. Right now we're struggling because the people that he put on the court, they're going to be there for probably the rest of my lifetime, but you go ahead and put two more on there, you're talking about completely and irreparably changing the trajectory of this country, um, all for the wrong. Democratic Congressman Jasmine Crockett of Dallas, thank you so much, we appreciate it. Thanks, Jack.